Hey, Rodney, how you doing? I'm great. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Where are you, where are you in the studio or? I'm in my studio at my, at my home, yes. Okay. See, I got the old dat machine. <laughs> Is the that old, the one that your dad uh, loaned you twelve hundred dollars to get? Oh, old MPC. Now this is actually my MP. My other MPC is at my other studio. The one my dad loaned me twelve hundred dollars off his life insurance to get. I still have it, actually. My goodness, you know, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> hearing your story. Um, can I, I saw I saw your interview did a power moves um, a year ago, and um, which was really powerful, especially. The relationship you have with your dad and that sort of mentoring so that's you know i'm a therapist and i work with under 21s and so mm -hmm. just hearing inspiration and, and trying to give vision to the young ones uh, because you know it's things as as we get each year things get darker and darker and so vision and, and inspiration you know is is something that they they do need and you know hearing that about your dad and, and how that's been implanted in you is really really a powerful part of your your testimony so i was really privileged to hear that so powerful man so powerful that it, it has literally um man it is inspired me to to be that for my children you know yeah uh, my four children and, and and really all those things that he embedded in me like you know having to take piano lessons i started taking piano lessons when i was five years old and my dad wow. had like house rule he's like you can't you can't play the piano you can't live in my house unless you play the piano <laughs> oh, so, so like i have that same rule now so all my <laughs> all my kids play the piano wow um, yeah yeah yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm going to start from the beginning because, we, we, you know, I'm based here in the UK. Uh, you know, I went to college in the US, but we do have an international audience. People from, from Australia, Singapore, Japan, they all tune in. So I almost give a sense of, you know, where were you born and raised so that they can have a sort of a geography understanding of where our guests are. So if we start off, where were you sort of born and raised? Yeah, I was born in um, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Okay. Uh, raised right on the outskirts of a small little town called Galloway Township. Um, and um, my dad's church was in Pleasantville. So it's kind of like these, those three between Atlantic City, Galloway and Pleasantville is kind of where, you know, I was all the time uh, growing up. And, 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 and I think for some of us, we, we associate Atlantic City like the sort of East Coast Vegas. Is that something, are we mistaken? Is that something close to that? It's, it's it's definitely like its own little casino okay. uh, boardwalk. You know, it's the bottom of the shore. Um, you know, not not wasn't any musical outlets. Yeah, when, you know, coming up there, there wasn't you know um, a lot of places to be discovered or studios or record company, anything like that. We didn't have that at all. It was like only maybe like one one small studio locally that that people would go to. Now, I mean, I guess growing up, because you mentioned about your dad, did did he have his own church, or was, or was he was he part of a church? Yeah, he, yeah, he had his own church. He still he still has the same church, <laughs> okay. in New Jersey. Um, yeah, and he he uh, he's been he's been preaching ever since he was. I think he was probably about I don't know, maybe like twenty one years old. He's been pastoring. Wow. For 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 he turned seventy nine this year, so wow, um, his whole life, yeah. Was was the vision for you growing up to to sort of join the ministry, you know, music director, and also join the uh, the pastoring service, or what was growing absolutely, up? Absolutely not. Absolutely. Oh, that wasn't a vision as a that kid. was everybody that was everybody else's vision for oh, me. Yeah, yeah. Everybody everybody in the church says you're gonna be a pastor one day. <laughs> like, you know, you know, but you know, you never know. I mean, you know, still got a long life to live still. So <laughs> yeah. know. Um, nah, my vision was really, it was, it was music from 10 years old. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. You know, I would, I would listen, I would sneak. We were, we weren't allowed to listen to secular music in, in my house growing up. Uh, I always, I grew up listening to the Winans and the Clark sisters and commission and BBC oh. and all just all amazing gospel artists. Yeah. And uh, so I would have to sneak to listen to like, you know, R&B and hip hop. So a lot of times you would, you know, catch me when I got to school with my friends, I'm listening to, you know, um, Rob Bass and DJ Easy Rock, or Big, <laughs> Big, Big Daddy Kane and Guy and all these different 
artist that would inspire, I guess, the 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 hip hop swag for me. Um, and so I would, you know, I would listen to those rhythms and those sounds. And because I played drums as well at church, I was playing those type of rhythms, those New Jack rhythms wow. in church. Oh, so everybody, everybody locally, I wasn't like the best drummer, but everybody locally knew like if they would come to my church and if I'm on the drums, I'm playing with a total different type of style than anybody <laughs> else in church. Wow. Uh, and I was, um, and I would, I remember being 10 years old. I remember being 10 years old and hearing, um, um, I believe it was, I was in the, I was in the mall in Toledo, Ohio, visiting our family. I remember hearing, um, um, human nature, uh, by Michael Jackson play through the mall. The Thriller album had just came out mm. and it was playing the Thriller album all through the mall. And I was just like blown away by how it sounded and I was just like I want to make music like that and and I remember like sneaking and my brother was seven years older than me so he had he had more access to things than I had access to <laughs> and I remember like he loved listening to like all the new Jack Swing stuff mm. and so I would um sneak in his room when he wasn't home and I would like go through his record collection and his CDs and different things and I would listen to like, let's say if I'm listening to um, uh, Heavy D and the boys, yeah. uh, you got your own thing. I would listen to the Maxi single version where it had like six different remixes. <laughs> on. And Teddy, Teddy would have like the Percapella, the <laughs> version and, you know, all these different, different Maxi single versions. And I would listen to it. But while I was listening to it, I would go to the credits and I would read the credits and I would and I would literally learn who was doing everything on what. Yeah. And then I would and I would be able to go to the next record and I would see, well, hold on. He produced that and he produced Keith Sweat. And then he produced this. Oh, and this the engineer Franklin Grant and John Marie. And this person is the assistant serving Gene and John Hay. Like I would I would know all these names at like 11 years old. You I could literally, I was like a walk-in like um credit person. Like on any <laughs> record, I would just know the credits. And because I did that, it made me like really learn what a producer was. Mm. Right. Because I would be like, OK, the guy who must be where it says produced by Teddy Riley, but then it says the bass by t bass synth by Teddy Riley or keys by Teddy Riley. Yeah. So he, he must be the one. The producer must be the one putting all the music together. That's what yeah. I would think in my mind. Right. So I was like, I want to be that guy. I want to be the person that does that. You know, and I'm I'm a massive Teddy fan. I mean, I you know, my whole music was Teddy Riley. Didn't matter. You know, if he did a remix that I, I bought the record and make it, that might make it last forever. He did all the, he did everything on that. That's probably one of my favorite stuff. And so as a New Jack fan, you became synonymous to us as somebody who had some connection with Teddy back in the day. So we've all been, you know, I was talking to New Jack fans. We've all sort of, you've been on our radar for such a long time because, you know, we followed Teddy, we, we knew Pharrell and all this stuff. So but I mean, it's really fascinating that, you know, at that young age um, that you'd follow the credits and, and see from, from that side. Did you just enjoy just creating music or what was the fascination about how music just became, had take that sort of hold on you? Yeah, I mean, I was, I, I love, I love all different genres, but I, you got to understand, like, to me, it was like, you know, to me as a, as from 10 to like, I don't know, to high school probably was like, those were the five years that really shaped me mm. as, a, as a, as a producer. And to me, New Jack Swing was like a genre. Like yeah. I didn't look at, I didn't hear, I looked at New Jack Swing as its own genre that create that Teddy created its own genre. And I was kind of obsessed with that genre, that style. Yeah. And so a lot of people don't know this, but all my music was all New Jack Swing. I started um, my, I started out as a kid doing nothing but New Jack Swing. I didn't, I didn't have any other type of style. Mm. I didn't even, you know, I didn't care to do any other type of style. In fact, I probably didn't switch up my style until 
I was probably like 16 or 17. And when I kind of, kind of moved away from the whole future thing, then it was just like, okay, I need to like develop my own type of sound. Still have his influence, of course. Yeah, yeah. Still have yeah. influences, but I need to start. I, I want to be kind of genreless. I want to be the, a producer you can call to do any artist in any style. Um, but I, for a man, for like six, five, six years, I was like, you would have thought I was Teddy Jr. <laughs> But everyone was doing that, you know, yeah, from Baby Fella and Babyface, they had to change their stuff around. Um, I would think Jam and yeah, Lewis. Because Teddy was the master of it. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. the, the difference was is like LA and Babyface, they they I call them they were great songwriters. Yeah. Like they could write really great songs over anything. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, like real musicians that can they, you know, they had they had little subtle things of New Jack Swing, but they also live more on the funk side of yeah, yeah. the whole print side of it as well. But Teddy was just in his just, you know, in his realm, you know, um, he was just, he he just was separate to me from the rest. Yeah. Because, because number one, his, his swing was a little bit different from their swing. Yeah. Their, their, theirs was more this, like LA and Baby Faces and Jimmy Jam was more, and Teddy was more, like it was like almost behind it was pushing and of course i'm cheating because i was around him at an <laughs> early age so i got a chance to see the master at work and it taught me a lot about how to shift things and make things move a certain kind of way yeah i mean what did you make of um, the winers it's time that's what i was about to get to so <laughs> like i grew up on the winers before it's time yeah so that so imagine growing up on the wine is going to all their concerts they know me by name since i was six years old wow little rodney they would call me on stage and then growing and listening to sneaking new jack swing and then one day your favorite gospel group now works with your favorite producer <laughs> That was kind of like trippy right it was uh, kind of like is this really happening like you know what i mean Oh, uh, it's funny you say that because I was just literally watching them perform It's Time on. I was just watching YouTube, like, literally okay. out and watching this, It's Time. Yeah, my favorite on that album was Don't Leave Me. I, I, I just love the beats, the drums on that. And, and yeah, but the, but the remix, too, though. Yeah, Eddie. I mean, I love Eddie, but I, I prefer the original. It, it, well, the original, the original, cause listen, you're not going to, you never, I don't care who you are. <laughs> You never, you're never going to outdo Teddy. Yeah, <laughs> in, that, in that era, in that era, you many a try, but they've all come come up short. It wasn't remix. There, I I can't tell you any remix of any of his songs that someone else did. I remember, I actually remember listening to certain remixes and be like, "Why did y'all let them remix it and you put that out? That's yeah. not better than the, you know, like the Bobby Brown stuff." Remember the comment? Yeah, 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 yeah like it's not. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, but, but I did, but I, you know, being a hip hop head too, I did like what Eddie F did with yeah, the, yeah. Da -da 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 -da, you know, I did yeah. like some of that stuff yeah. too. But it's just but the yeah. message between the original, the message of the song is so powerful. I mean, you, you know, yeah. you, you know, um, it's just a powerful song. And then the, the singing, I mean, it, um, yeah, so it was my favorite track on that album. And I wish they just released the original because it, it was, I think even as a Christian, that had such a powerful message. And I think the remix, it kind of diluted the message and it was the song. So that, that was just my, just, this is my stuff. Yeah. Plus you did stuff with um, Phase 2. Like, I love that album. Yeah, Phase 2. Phase yeah, two. I love that album. And I remember... That was full circle. Full circle. I, yeah, I, and I remember when I, um, I was talking to some producer back in the day and I said, this, if I was making music, this was the kind of music that I would want it for gospel kind of music, like where it could cross through and stuff. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, the album didn't do as well, but it, 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 yeah. you know, I loved a lot of the, you know, Let Them In, you know, I loved the um, it, Real Love, Thank You. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what was, I mean, was it because you had the relationship with, with them for that long that they... Yeah, they, yeah, the, yeah. Carbon, Carbon Winans was over the group phase two and he reached out to me and was telling me about the sons are going to be putting the group together and we would love to, to get you on it. And the funny thing, I remember telling Marvin's son, Coconut, he didn't believe that I knew his dad. Like, he didn't believe it. He was like, no way. I was like, yeah, man. And I called, like, called his dad in front of him and he was just like, <laughs> Little Rodney, he was like, blown away by that. 
No, yeah. it's a, it was a love. I still listen to it today. It's a pity that it, as I said, it didn't, it didn't do as well. It, it, I mean, probably now it would have done. Good. But what was your thought about the success of it, how it, it came out? I mean, yeah, I mean, you know how it goes. Like every every, every era is different, right? It's, yeah. it's being, it's, it's are you going to be accepted in the era? Like you're right. Like sometimes you could be three years early, too early, yeah. or, or three years too late. You know, it just depends. You know. Yeah. It, with them, I think it might have been just a just a tad too early for what they were trying to go. Yeah, if it, yeah, I think just a couple of years, and and I think there's also a lot of resistance within the gospel community about oh. whoa, whoa, it's becoming too commercial because they didn't like BB and CC. So I'm there sure they go. thought about them, and because people would say no, it's not really Christian and stuff. So and so that was a battle I was having then. So I I knew that it was a good album, it was a powerful album. Probably as I said, just the timing and stuff. But then yeah. with God, everything is perfect. So, you know, that's right. Yeah. You know, I spoke to, I'm very good friends with Sprague and Mucho. And, um, and you know, the, the, Mucho was talking about, yeah, when those Rodney. Are the, Mucho, those, are the, those are the Avengers, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the those Avengers. guys are the Avengers. Sprague and Mucho, those are Avengers, man. Yeah. They, 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 they were saying, man, when Rodney came to the studio back then, you know, they were hoping. That you were going to join in because they would have pushed them back then but you know they, they said no it's you know between you and your dad it, it didn't work out which you know in the long run is better but they were really impressed by what you brought and they thought having the young energy and competition would have just taken them out of their comfort zone like oh man this kid's doing this we need to <laughs> up our game but when you came into the studio and saw all these established older guys producers you know, because he was, you know, basic black and he, he, you know, he had his, you know, what was it for you? Like, were you intimidated? Were you just in awe? Were you learning from not just Teddy, but the, you know, the other guys around? Yeah, I definitely wasn't intimidated. If anything, I was, um, I was, I was very confident in my, in my abilities. Um, but I was also very inspired by the, the, the guys that Teddy had around. Um, you know, I remember hearing, I think it was Roughneck by, yeah. Light, and I think Mutual worked on that. Yeah. And I remember hearing it for, and I, I still to this day think that's one of the hardest mixes that came from Future Sound recording that him and Teddy did to this day. I still listen to that beat like, gosh, that beat is just like in your face, cutting, like just crushing you. And, in, in, you know, um, and so, uh, so, you know, I, I had nothing but respect for those guys. Sprague, I mean, Sprague to me was, you know, a genius, you know what I mean? Because I, I, you know, you, you got to remember, I was coming down when I could, right? Because I was still in school. So it would be summertime, <laughs> go down there and come down. I remember when Teddy was working on uh, the the My Love remix for Mary G. Blige. Oh, with yeah. me, and I was there watching him create it. And then I was wow. watching, you know, some of the, the remixes he was doing. I was watching Sprague, you know, working on stuff. And then Teddy finished the style. I was like, man, like these guys are just like the Avengers. These guys are pros, you know what I mean? And I'm just, a, I'm just a young kid, you know what I mean? And I was like, just thrilled that they liked, liked my stuff. But to, for me, like, it, it, you know, that was the 18, you know what I mean? And like, you got to work your way up to get into that, into that 18, that eight room. You got to work your way into that. And so for me, it was just like I was just, man, I was watching like a hawk. I really was. I would sit down and just, I was just studying and I was taking it all in and understanding like, yo, this is a chance for me to learn how to really make a real record and for, and, and to really, um, to, to hopefully be something special in this, in this industry. Um, but I also, also, you know, at, at some point I also knew like as much as I loved it, loved being down there and as much as I admired Teddy and the crew and everybody down there, I also knew I wanted to also be somewhat my own guy, my own leader and build my own organization, um, you know, and, and find people like the same way Teddy had me, Pharrell, eventually I would have people like D. Mile and Harmony Samuels and I would build my own thing like that, you know what I mean? And I kind of knew that, I'm crazy, I kind of knew that at 16 years old, that was like the path for me. I mean, at, at that time, you know, because Teddy started as a child prodigy, I mean, I've, I've spoken to um, Jimmy Jenkins, who co-founded Uptown with Andre, and they talked about his little kid, Teddy. So he started as a kid and, and moved his way up. So 
it's if you have it doesn't matter how old you are it's almost as if if you if you know what you have being your own independent person you know doors there were doors will definitely open well was pharrell around when you were coming down did you yeah neptunes yeah i saw pharrell i saw pharrell i didn't see him a lot because i think at that time you know, I probably was catching Pharrell, right? Him and Chad, I think they finally were moving into their own studio okay. space. And they were still, but I would see them still come through and play and play beats for Teddy. And and you guys were probably around the same age or so. What did you what was your impression seeing? Did you guys did you see them and think they're gonna make it the same way because the sounds were different? Yeah, because we got really actually me and Pharrell was cool. Like like Pharrell would send me stuff. Um, actually, when I worked with Michael, I played Pharrell's beats for Michael. I tried to get Pharrell on Michael's album. So <laughs> Pharrell sent me stuff. And I the, the song um, Rock Your Body by Justin Timberlake, mm. Pharrell gave me that to play for Michael. I played it for Michael, but Michael didn't want it. Didn't want it because I think Michael was kind of more about, you know, track wise in that in that time in that space. He was really look, listening for the instrumentals, not necessarily the songs yeah. at first. But I definitely played his stuff for Michael. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now I was gonna, I'll, I'll get to Invincible because you know yeah. I have my 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 you know the two th people who were always Michael was always number one, and then you know there's yeah. always Teddy. And when they did the Dangerous album, it was to me it was like, oh my goodness, this is this is gold. Um, yeah. So, but I, I I guess I wanted to get to. Um, um, I kind of lost it there, but you know, so you, you leave. You know, I, I heard a story about your dad giving you know the whole MP3, the whole connection with um, is it Jim Jones at Uptown? Oh, James 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 Jones, James Jones yeah. at Uptown. So people don't know is that he was an A and R at Uptown. You sent yeah. him your demo, and he he sort of brought you brought you along and stuff. Yeah. How as a Christian, because you know I, I know how faith even now plays a big part in your life moving into new york and then having your faith and then having the music industry how did you sort of separate okay Stop. i'm in it but I'm I, not saw, gonna be I, I definitely was exposed to things that i definitely was not exposed to previously and so i remember living with james jones and you know, I was I was in church five days out the week, and now and then all of a sudden I'm I'm living in Hackensack, New Jersey, with James at his apartment, and I'm seeing women come in and out of his apartment every day. It was like it was completely different, and I was young, and it was just like you know it was kind of everything was happening so fast. Um, but they kind of everybody that knew about me, they knew I kind of had certain standards. Okay. Um, when it came to like you know, sessions and working with people and everything, you know, you can't, you can't tell anybody what to do, but you can also, but you can have certain rules and lay those rules down in your own domain, right? In your, in your facilities. And so that's what I would do. And um, people had to respect it. Um, but I had to, yeah, I had to navigate a lot of my faith throughout my career. You know what I mean? It's always been one of those things where, you know, you're in the, the industry, your know, wicked industry, you know, uh, it's very wicked, you know, and, um, but I think we've done, we've done, I think we've done a good job by, by not only just being in the industry and, and, and I guess being a light um, in the industry, but also witnessing the people in the industry and praying for people in the industry wow. and being used by God in every, so many people's lives, whether it was James Jones, by the way, James Jones, my dad prophesied on James, James Jones for our first meeting and told him he was going to be a pastor. And I was kicking my dad under the desk <laughs> and telling him to shut up. And, and James Jones laughed at my dad. And sure enough, like five years later, James Jones became a pastor in Atlanta. Wow. Um, and then, you know, me and my father praying for Michael Jackson, you know, um, Whitney Houston singing at my dad's church, uh, me praying with Mary J. Blige, and Mace getting saved through me witnessing to him. Wow. So like so many, so many, so many moments and so many sessions that I've literally, some people, you know, um, well, when, the, when the Chris Brown and Rihanna thing happened, you know, I was sent to Orlando to kind of be somewhat like a, like a life coach to Chris. Wow. You know what I mean? And, and when Justin Bieber had his little moments, I was sent to go on tour with Justin to try to help him out. 
So like people in the industry kind of call on me because they know that character about me, which is which is great. You know what I mean? That's why I always say like um, um, the the ministry, the industry has somewhat become like my ministry in a sense, right? Just like you know, without even trying, it's just like people know our character, know what we stand on. So I get those calls a lot, like, "Hey, man, so and so needs needs someone, and we thought about you. Can you come pray with them?" Or da 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 da. And I've also made it very um, um, intentional to be bold in my faith. And not worry about what people think about, you know, whether they, oh, that's corny. Or if they don't believe, like, I don't care. Like, it's just like, okay, this is what I stand on. This is more what I believe in. You, you could you could work with me or not. But I'm just letting you know this is what it is. You know, yeah. so, yeah. How, how does that, because um, I know you had a, 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 when I look at a lot of credits from songs you've written, it was yourself, it's Fred, LaShawn, I mean, does it change the lyrics contents of the song say my oh, name or, or boys my anything totally i mean if you look at if you look at like i would probably say 99.9 percent .9 of the catalog you're not really going to see songs that make you say oh that's filthy that's nasty oh there's a bunch of cursing in that you're just not going to get that from my catalog you know mo you know most of the stuff that was actually written by um uh, myself LaShawn, Fred, my my team is 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 usually just wholesome songs with like concepts. Back then it was more so like you treated me wrong because that was like the end thing for female empowerment back then, right? Yeah. Um, but you don't get like just like bad songs. The only time it gets like a little sketchy is when you start working with like let's say rappers who who you know you can't write their lyric for them, you know, <laughs> they're talking about their own personal situation. Yeah or whatever so it gets a little bit like oh whoa whoa i didn't i didn't you know expect it to go that route or you know i always say like the one thing that i that if any if i had any regrets the regrets i would have is like when you do a song and you have no control over the video and then they make a video and you're like man i, I can't even watch that i can't even show that to my, my child yeah. You know, like why did they have to go that route with the video? It wasn't it wasn't <laughs> supposed to be that. You know, they want to be super creative, and and now it's explicit, and now it's vulgar, and that's not what that song was intended to do. Yeah. Uh, so you know, I wish it was like I had more control over being able, like, yo, if you if you want me to produce the record, then I gotta have I have to have final final say so over the video <laughs> you used to make. You know what I'm saying? Like, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> that have never that has never happened, but I wish. You know? Yeah, but then again, you know that what what lasts the, the time is the music, is the lyrics, is the words. Um, you know, most of you know, nowadays everything. You know, we're, we're watching it, we're listening as we're going. So we may forget the video, but we're listening to the to the music and 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 the words. And those are the words are the prophecy. Those are the ones spoken into somebody's life. So th those are the big ones. Um, yeah. What was the you know, one of the first ones that we really saw you out in the video was with um, the th Gina, and and I, and I remember speaking with her, and she spoke about how um, she got signed um, by you by uh, by the Rev and, and, and oh, yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, from your point of view, how did that whole you know when you were starting off was because that's was about ninety six was almost one of the first ones we yeah, seen. I was, I was coming out of high school, so it could have been. It could have even been before that. It might not have came out to then. Okay. But, you know, you got to remember, like, if we were working to build up to even getting a record deal. We had to do demos first. Yeah. Uh, because, like, you know, her her sister sang on my first independent rap gospel album when I was 14. <laughs> Selena. Selena, her sister, sang. So her sister and her sister's husband, they used to go to a church called Bridgeton Tabernacle. And that was a church that my my dad's church fellowship. So I know I used to hear about Gina. I used to hear about Gina could sing, but I never saw her sing. I always it was her sister. Her sister sounded like like um she sounded just like um uh, Tremaine Hawkins to me. Okay. So in the church, we I, I used to always like you know be in church listening to singers. I'd be like, she was amazing to me, her sister. And then one day, finally. Somehow, um, um, there was a, a a group called Spirit in um, in the, like the South Jersey area, and it was he was his name was George, 
I don't know if you ever heard of a kid named Young Steph, but Young Steph's dad, George, was her uncle or cousin or something. I think it might have been her uncle. And he's the one that came to me like, yo, I, I want you to hear, I, I got somebody I want you to hear, Gina Thompson. Um, I think it was him that first brought her or, or even or even maybe Kenny Buckman. It was somebody in the either George, I can't remember. It's one of those two though. And all I remember is when I heard Gene, I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is <laughs> this girl is like it's like if 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 I if if I could describe it, it's it for me it was Shirley Murdoch and Coco mixed. Wow, right? Like the inflections and the vibrato and the things that she was doing, and I was just like, man, you know, I didn't really, I was new in the game, and it was more so like, yo. Okay, let's go. Let's let's start. We started. We had a production company. Let's sign Gina. Let's do some demos and let's try to get her a deal. And man, we did like, man, we we did like a few demos and took her to New York. And I don't even think we went to a bunch of record companies. To be honest, I think we might have went to like we might have went to like Boost Carbone over at Mercury Records because I had already had a deal with him on one of my rappers. Um, we had a song, my rapper Hodge, called Head Nod that was on the Black Panther soundtrack. And so it was just more so, hey, Lee Bruce, that was one of our relationships. Yo, we got this girl you can check out. And so took Gina up there and Gina, out, you know, she could just sing. She can just flat out sing, she, you know, just incredible. And um, next thing you know, we're in Bass Hit Studios every day making an album. Wow. And uh, in New York, and 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 then you know, I was able to utilize um, Puff Daddy, Diddy, Sean Combs, Love, yeah. whatever you want to call him. <laughs> he wanted to sign me as a producer to the Hitman. Oh goodness! Yeah. So this is before the things you do, the Bad Boy remix, any of that. He heard I was mastering Gina's album at the Hit Factory with her power. Uh, okay. And it just so it just so happened that he he was in a room next door and he heard me working on it through the hall through the wall and he walked in and said yo what's that and her was like yo this is kid and his artist so he's like yo i'm picking you up tomorrow so did he he picked me up the next day and literally was trying to get me to sign to become one of the hitmen with stevie j and chucky and everybody on that team so what i did was utilize that relationship and was like, yo, because at that time, Puff was the remix king in New York. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was like, yo, I got this artist. We got this record. What if you did a remix? Da, 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 da. And he was like, I thought he was just going to shoot me down. Because, <laughs> you know, he was working with all these big artists and she was like brand new. She didn't even have an album. We didn't have a song out yet. Oh. And, and he was like, yeah, let's do it. So I'm like, yo, Gina, I got Puff. And then nobody who nobody knew who Missy was, but you know, uh, other, it, like you had to really be like deep in it to know like you know, Missy was like part of this girl group that was signed to Devante. Yeah, you know sister, what I mean? yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, but she stood out, right? And so next thing you know, Puff was like, "Yo, I'm gonna put this girl Missy on it," and everything just happened. It just like was like, and I, you know, it was funny because I remember like it was funny. I go back to like when we were doing. The things you do to the, the the bad boy remix, right? If you if, if in, which was super dope because I remember walking in Puff had three studios, right? <laughs> in the middle, the two the two big studios, and then he had a little small room. And the the little small room in the middle is where he got all his samples from. It was just a record player and speakers. So I walked in and he was like, All right, we're gonna work on this remix for Gene. And he was like, he he was like he was playing like records that he thought was hot samples, and I was listening. And I was like, nah. And then he pressed. He went to play one, and then he he stopped himself from playing it. I was like, no, 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 play that one. Play that one. And then he he's like, nah, nah. I'm saving that for my. I'm saving that for for something else. I was like, nah, 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 nah. Play that puff. Play it. Play it. <laughs> and it was and it was the boom. Dum, it was the it was the yeah. sample, um, the Bob James sample, or whatever, right? And that's not, I was like, nah, we gotta have that one, Puff. We gotta have that one. And I convinced them to give us that that particular break beat. And that's and then we went in the studio and we just started laying the keys down and and you know getting it going. And the funny thing is, it was like 
Gina really, if you listen, like she really sings on every song, but then Puff wanted her to like dumb down her voice. So he was just like, I don't want to hear any vibrato. Oh. She was a little frustrated in the beginning when she first was recording because she was like, you know, that that's not how I sing. <laughs> You know, but Puff also, is, he has his genius. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and you respect his genius. And his genius was, you got all the riffs and you got all of that on all the records that Rodney played me, but I want you to just be simple. I want this to be the jam in the clubs where it's like, mm. you know, everybody can sing along. And if you listen to that hook, it's just like, he took, he took from the original, he took half of the hook and made it repeat, right? That's what he did. Mm. And, and, and he made her sing it very just monotone, not a lot of like vibrato at all. I think every time she tried to add vibrato, he's like, no vibrato, every single time. Wow. Every wow. single time. So that's how that came about, man. And it's just like, and, and that was a moment. You got to understand, like, that was a moment for um, Gina, for, for myself, for the whole South Jersey. Because Gina was from South Jersey, too. Yeah. So Gina was putting South Jersey on the map. You know what I mean? We ain't never had an artist come from South Jersey like that. <laughs> so, and that song was rocking the clubs and radio yeah. out there, like nonstop. So, you know, that was a that was an incredible moment, man. I, I just blessed to even blessed to be able to to just to be able to discover Gina because she was definitely her voice was just just she just she's still just just dope. Yeah, just, but even for Missy too, because that was also that was the the world being introduced to her at the same time because it was something that you know we the his style of rap and stuff and for all of us he, like, he, 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 how, he, <laughs> he, he, like who does that right who does that and that was that character right and people yeah. connect, people connected with that but for you watching how did he because yeah he, he he says he's the king of remakes and stuff but he he, he as you mentioned he he wanted to focus on the music and the clubs. And when, you know, when I spoke to Cassidy, Cassidy said he just, when Diddy saw the fact that he played a lot of old school stuff, he was really interested in that because it's like sounds that people don't know. You know, he gives us, you know, his remixes and all his songs with stuff like, well, yeah, I haven't heard that song in, in 20, 30 years. I mean, he'll bring out the rare stuff, but really make it hot. What was it like for you as a young producer, you know, first, you know, being inspired by Teddy, who was creating emerging church and all that totally stuff together. Different. It was totally different because Teddy was, remember, Diddy doesn't play any instruments. Yeah. Teddy Teddy could do everything himself. Teddy didn't need me. He didn't need Mucho. He didn't need Sprague. He didn't need Pharrell. He didn't need anyone. He could do it all himself. He only, he only, he only brought us on because the bandwidth grew. Yeah. Once the bandwidth grew, it's like you, 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 you're more in demand, so you got to create a team now. Right, Diddy didn't play anything, so Diddy could literally tell you, "Yo, I want." I remember the first time I was working on something for Diddy. I did the the total. I did the total. No one else remix with Foxy Brown, Little Kim, and the Brat. And I remember the first time I did that with him. I went to go lay my my hands down to play the chord. He said, "No, no, you only. I only want you to use three fingers." And I was like, "What?" Because I'm used to playing chords with all my, he's like only three fingers because in his mind, that's sim that's simplistic to him, wow. right? So even though he didn't play, he knew exactly what it was he wanted to hear. And that also taught me something. What it taught me was you don't have to be a keyboard player to be a producer. Mm. So a lot of times when I was a kid, I read the credits and I thought whoever did the keys was the producer, but that's not the case. That's why if you look at the wine and First album was produced by Bill, Bill Maxwell. Bill Maxwell was a drummer, but he produced the wine his first album. Yeah. You understand know what I'm saying? So I started to learn what a producer's job and role was. And so Diddy, Diddy, I always tell people like, yo, Diddy can't play, da da da. I say, yeah, but all his records have, a, have the same similar sound. So he knew how to get that sound out of all the producers and that he worked with. He knew how to get that bad boy sound out of it. Yeah. I mean, in in the midst of that, what about the the role of the the engineer? For you, you know, I've interviewed John Marie, you know, and I know he he went to work with you uh, very, uh, after he left Teddy and stuff. But what yeah. was it, did you learn about the engineer and the mixing and like because Teddy was almost him and Dave Wade, that master of mixing. He's telling stuff. you, listen, listen, listen. <laughs> I was I was there. Teddy didn't need anybody. Teddy didn't need anybody. 
Teddy could Teddy could mix the record himself. He only he only needed people because he the bandwidth grew because he was in so much demand that it, in order I would watch Teddy work on. Uh, I never forget watching him doing the My Love remix for Mary J. Blige. And at the same time, he's working on uh, a Patti LaBelle remix of uh, All This Love all this or whatever love. it was. Yeah, all this love. Or he's working on this. He's working on three to four or five songs in the same day. Right? So when it's time for him to go see his kids or go bowling or whatever it was, <laughs> That's when Dave Way or the rest of the guys would pull it, the other ones on and work on that. It was just a bandwidth thing, Ooh. right? Because he has so much going on. But I'm telling you right now, I was there. He could do it himself. He didn't, you know, there's always been this like debate about um about um SWV's right here remix, right? And you, you remember you got, you know, the, the whole thing is, well, all Star came up with the remix and da da. Okay. No one, no one ever said he didn't. But that mix is Teddy Riley. If Teddy Rock, you can. The bottom line is, if you're a Teddy Riley connoisseur of everything that he's done, you know what his sonic sound like, and you can go back and listen to every All Star track that he's ever done, and from a quality perspective and a sonic perspective, none of them sound like right here. None of them. He did another. He, matter of fact, there's an all star remix to um, I'm anything. Okay, no, anything, anything. anything. Yeah. Anything. If you listen to anything and you put anything on and, and put right here on, sonically, it's two different worlds. But if you put right here on next to the Teddy Riley, I'm so into you remix, they live in, 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 in Roughneck by MC Light. They yeah. all live in the same sonic spectrum. So my argument in that whole debate is. <laughs> Whether Teddy played the keys on it or not, or whatever, he did something. And whatever he did, it brought it to life. Mm -hmm. Whatever he did. I don't care if it's calling Michael Jackson to get the sample clear <laughs> and using yeah. that relationship. But sonically, I hear it. Sonically from a mixed perspective. And not mm -hmm. even being there, I know what Teddy snares. Yeah. When I know when he mixes the, the, the snap with the snares. And when you go down the board and you got 12 different snares playing at the same time, and, and, and that's Teddy. Nobody was doing that. Everybody was doing one snare, sample an sample a old break beat, and they use that snare. But Teddy, he would have six, seven kicks, six, seven snares, and all these different percussion things going on. And you were like, okay, I, <laughs> I, I, know, I, know, I know from a sonic thing when it's Teddy. Yeah, right? yeah, and that's, the, and that's the bottom line. Like you know, you can't. We're not taking anything away from the genius of All Star in that in that moment. But at the same token, you can't take any way anything away from the genius of Teddy Rob. Yeah, yeah. As I said, I, I, I can't can't disagree with you anymore because, as I said, I, you know, listening to Teddy from the stuff he did with Kumo D, um, the stuff he did with um, Big Daddy Kane. Um, you know, as a kid, he even mixed them um, so um, um, back to I think keep on moving with for so so to so. You know, Jane Childs. I, I don't want to fall in love. I mean, it, it's he even did twenty three hundred Jackson Street. So he's the only one who's worked with all Jacksons all at the same time. So, um, you know, yeah. So he, yeah, yeah. As I said, as you know, we yeah, as I said, he he, he the genius. What did you make of Dangerous? Um, the, you know, he did about seven tracks on Dangerous, you know. Yeah, I feel like, okay, so I'll tell you what I feel about Dangerous. Some of Teddy's best production from a standpoint of being, you can tell he was being challenged by Michael with the Sonics and different things, right? Yeah. Uh, arguably, Remember Tom is still probably one of my favorite, you know, songs. I mean, him and Bernard Bell just went in on that, right? Yeah. I felt that they should have let Teddy just mix the whole album. Yeah. Because yeah. the mixes, and this is how you know the difference, the mixes of Dangerous and the mixes of Bobby Brown's, which were all done in, in a similar time frame, yeah. Yeah. right? If you put Bobby Brown's album on, right next to Michael's, 
you're here to knock is way harder. Mm. Right. So it's like, and I know what that means. That means that Michael had like his teams of mixers that he was used to working on it. And, but when Teddy did Bobby Brown, it's like Teddy and his squad. It's yeah. just Teddy and John Marie, whoever it was yeah. in his squad. And you hear the difference when you hear that's the way love, the, um, that's the, um, that's the yeah. way. The, love. Uh, that's the love way it goes. Yeah. You can play that thing. Yeah, one two more compared night. game and one more night is something in common and all. You just hear, you hear the, 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 the roundness, you hear the heaviness, yeah. you hear that's Teddy. Yeah. And that's what I wanted for Dangerous. So when I hear certain songs on Dangerous, I hear all the sounds cutting through and I hear all of that, but I'm also like, man, can you imagine if Teddy would have just been allowed to mix it himself? Yeah, you know, I you bet know. you and I bet you there's demos. Yeah. I bet you there's demos that knock harder than the actual the actual mixes that came out on day. I guarantee it. Yeah. Guarantee I, it. Yeah. I mean, as I said, it 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 had amazing production, but I um, the Bobby album is one of my favorite because it just sounded, it just had so much. I, mean, I think speaking to Eric Williams from Blackstreet, he said that when um, MCA said, listen to this kind of, he was part of the flex. And um, Lou Sal Jr. said, look, look at the production you guys are doing, listen to the Bobby album. And they just like, like look at the, the whole production. And Teddy was in his element with that Bobby album. And I think, with the Marky album, he, he didn't have the freedom, as you said, because as I said, I've seen the stuff with he with, did it with Guy and I, stuff. I used to, I used to hate playing my music for Teddy. I'll tell you a little quick story. He doesn't he doesn't even know this. Only person that knows this is my brother. So when I first got the opportunity to play my music for Teddy, the first time when my dad drove us to Virginia Beach, that six hour drive. And I got a chance to play it and to see him and Big Bub and all the people in the room went crazy, right? And I was just, that was such a moment for me. And Teddy told me, man, you can come down here anytime you want. And I would come down and I would be down there. And anytime Teddy's like, yo, you want to, you got something you want to play me? Whenever I play it and hear it in his, because he had the best sound in the world coming from, you know, I'm coming from the basement in Jersey. <laughs> so now I'm hearing it and it's, I was supposed to be heard. And I'm listening. And I'm like, yo, I know I'm listening to my own music in the studio. I'm like, oh, this sounds incredible. And then soon as Teddy pressed play or whatever he was working on after me, oh my gosh, I'll be like, I shouldn't have played that. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh, he because his his he was on such a different level sonically, he, you know. He's in a, but I would I would just be like, oh man, I can't ever play my music first with him because <laughs> if he plays his music after me, he's just gonna go like this. And, and so it would, it would it would humble me. I would tell my brother, I'd be like yo, did you hear how it sounded? Like, we got to go back to work. Like, yo, we not there yet. Like, listen to the way his stuff sounds. And I know he had millions of dollars worth of equipment and I was working with like $500, $500 worth of equipment, right? But it was just like, man, I, I can make it sound better and I can make it sound better. So that was my goal. Every time I left, my goal was to come back better. Wow. Every time, go back and be like, okay, now when I play and stuff, man, I would see the difference. I would see him like, Oh, you've been working. Oh, you've been working. <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm, I'm tooling myself. I'm, I'm getting better because I, because I'm, I'm listening to a master. Imagine, imagine you a basketball player and you're 14 years old and you have access to LeBron James or Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan. That's what it was for me. Yeah, I had, ac I had access to a master. Yeah, I mean, he was. Yeah, as I said, for you then, were you? What what comes first when you're creating music? Is it the the do you write like, like a baby face or was it the, yeah. the sound like Teddy and then you put the lyrics on top? Uh, of it? It, for me, it's always been melody first. Okay. Yeah, like I mean, sometimes I'll start with the beats. Like if if there's something that is, if it's a break beat or something that inspires me or a certain snare kick, that moment. But I'm 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 usually going to sit down with a piano or some type of synth patch and I'm going to start playing chords. And that's just that's and I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with chords first. I tell you what's crazy. So, so all right, you know a lot of people don't know this, right? I'm giving you like the the, the real. I met Michael Jackson because of Teddy Riley. Okay. So so I was at Future in Virginia Beach, and late one night, Teddy said, not wasn't late, it's was probably about six o'clock in the evening. He said, everybody pack up. We're, and it was three Quest vans out front. 
He said, we're going to New York. And he didn't tell anybody why. There was no reason. And he had me in the van with him. So I was in the car with him. Daryl Shuler was driving. It was me, Daryl, and Teddy. And I'm sitting in the van with him. And the whole way to New York, he's playing Michael Jackson. Off the wall, thriller, dangerous. He's playing all of that. And I'm sitting in the back seat. And I'm starting to think, like, as a producer, you study who you about to work with. So I'm sitting, I'm like, yo, is we about to go, like, to New York to work with Michael? So I'm like, you know, I'm young. I'm like, you know, super young, 16, 17 years old. And I'm just like tripping. So we get to New York, check in the hotel, like one o'clock in the morning, we get to New York, check in the hotel. 30 minutes later, my phone rings and it's Teddy. And he said, yo, little bro, meet me downstairs. I go down, I go downstairs and we drive over to the hit factory. And it's just me and Teddy and Daryl Shula. Out of everybody that was down in, in Virginia that left, he chose me to go with him. I don't know why. He chose me to go with him, and there was Michael Jackson. And he told Michael Jackson, you need to work with this kid someday. What? So you need to work with this kid someday. And I was like, I was sitting there. You got to understand, I'm sitting there like, hey. <laughs> I'm looking at Michael and this, Teddy Michael, Teddy Michael, I'm like, yo, this is crazy. And he was, and Michael was like, really? He's like, yeah, I'm telling you, he's like, this kid got something. And I said, yeah, I'm gonna work with you someday, Michael. And he's like, okay, he kind of giggled. He's like, okay. <laughs> and, and all I remember, like we were there and, and Michael was telling Teddy, I guess they were about to work on like history stuff for history or whatever it was, which I don't believe any of that stuff went on there. And he had some crazy stuff. I remember this one particular track that he had that was crazy. I still remember it to this day. And um, we left and Teddy was set up in the hit factory, but Teddy wasn't really focused on Michael either. He was really there focused on Black Street and Men of Vision. Mm -hmm. and, and I never forget, he put me in a room upstairs, a little, this little room. And he came in the room, and, I, and this is the first time Teddy ever did this with me. I think this was the test for him to know if I had it or if I really had it or not. He came in my room. He goes, yo, so I want you to work with Men of Vision. And I said, oh, yeah, dope. And he goes, so check it. Here's the progression. And he started playing like a progression on the, on the keys. And, he was go and I was looking at it, and I said, hold on, do it one more time. And he did it, and I caught it the second time what he was doing. And he left me. And then I and then I went to sounds that I know Teddy used because I've been around him so much. So I loaded up those sounds and I started doing it and I worked on the track. And he came back in later on and I pressed play and Men of Vision and Chauncey and Black Street, all of them were there. And he was like, yo, you nailed it. And I was like, yeah, I can't wait for you to put your hands on it. He said, I'm not touching that. He said, the only thing I'm doing is mixing it. I was like, nah, you got to He's like, nah. It's, he's like, nah, it's fine the way it is. Wow. And that's why I would tell people, if you listen to, when you get a chance, you probably don't even know this, but if you go, there's a, the, um, there's a song called Instant Love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instant, yeah, instant that's Love. All, that's, all, that's all me. And that's why I tell people I was New Jack swinging. Like if you listen, that's all everything on there was me. Oh, I thought I was right? Spanky. I was, okay. No, so that's and, all. Uh, Spanky wrote it, but the okay, track, okay. The, track, the track is all me. And I wanted it so bad to be me and Teddy because he gave me the chords to play. Oh. So I thought that I was going to lay down the foundation, get it going, and then he's going to come in and he's going to, you know, do his Teddy thing to it. And he he didn't. He loved it so much. He was just like, yo, little bro, it's dope the way it is. And so that's what I'll tell people. Like, if you really look at, like, after that is when I kind of transitioned out of that style. But I was New Jack swinging it. That was, you know, that was ah. Teddy giving me those chords. Da -da 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 yeah, all, yeah. Of that, all of that was Teddy telling me, telling me exactly what he heard in his head. In, yeah, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's you know, because we, 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 a lot of people might think that, um, yeah, because, you know, for, for what he went through with, with, with Gene and stuff, to be able to set up his own stuff and to give other people opportunity, I don't think we can appreciate the foundation he's laid for everyone else and stuff. 
you know, especially in that industry, as you said, it's not an easy industry to be in and stuff like that. I mean, you, you'd even say about the fact that you were sitting next to the greatest entertainer in the world. Did, was it like shock just seeing him and, and, and actually, I mean, because, you know, you, you yeah. talked about <laughs> it's off the wall. And yeah, but it, 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 made, it made everything more tangible, right? Because it was like, okay, if, if he's vouching for me right now, which he was vouching for me a lot, and that time, he was telling a lot of people, even in New York, yo, I got this kid up here. He's only 16. Y'all better watch out for him. I'm telling you. Yeah, and, and the reason why is because I would be in his B room, you know, and I would be creating as fast as anybody else. So you got to remember, like, in that time, Teddy could do, you know, eight, nine, ten tracks a day easily. And not everybody can do that. But I brought that type of energy and hunger down there as well. I could do it. You know, it might not have been on the level of him at that time, right? But I could do it. Yeah. And so a lot of the other producers would be like, yo, this kid is not playing around. Like, he's hungry. He's coming out here hungry. So that's how I got along with everybody because they saw that passion and that determination. So to see Michael was one thing. Like, whoa, this is tangible. Like, I'm sitting here with Michael. But I'm also being the, the, the king of New Jack Swing is telling him about me. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that. He could have just been like, yeah, you know, pleasure to meet you, da 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 introduce him. That's all. He'd have to say, this is the guy you need to work with in the future. He'd have to do that, man. He'd have to do that. I mean, most people would. It says, it says, a, lot, it says a lot about Teddy. Yeah, because most people would think, if because if you do that, you're pretty much saying, because eventually you, you'd get better, then it's pretty much just taking away your own meat if if you're doing that but that's that's that is that's a powerful thing you know that most of us wouldn't have known because you you come on the invincible project and i just found footage of teddy telling that story too a little bit i'll send i'll send it to you i found okay. footage. i found he was on i don't know if it was breakfast club or something he was on break and he told a story about him introducing me to michael yeah i mean you, you come on to invincible i mean okay how did how did you get called on to do invincible because i guess um, um, but yeah, I guess for, for some of us, Yami, because you were, you know, goodness, as, as I said, one of my favorite tracks by you is um, I Can Love You. I just love the uh, dun 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 dun. I just, then, you know, had Little Kim's rap on it. Um, I love Share My Was, my favorite Mary album. And, yeah. and your, your production on, on that is just, it's just uh, unreal. Um, but I, 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 I'll come back to those ones. But I wanted to get to Invincible. How did you get the call? To actually, you know, I, had to, I was at my mom. I was at my mom and dad's house, and I had a dream. I was literally sleeping on that couch, and I had a dream that I was on my way to the studio, and it was all glass. And I looked as I drove to the studio. I looked up in the glass, and it was Michael with a red shirt on. And I was going to work with Michael, and I woke up from sleep telling my mom and dad the dream. The phone rings an hour later. And at the time I had like the, I had maybe like one of the biggest records out with Say My Name with Destiny's Child. <laughs> and I get a call from Carol Bear Sager. Okay. And Carol Bear Sager says, Ronnie, I'm, I'm a big fan of you and I love this song. And I, and I wondered if you'd be interested in, in, in writing with me and Michael Jackson. And I'm like, I just, I was just dreaming. I was working with Michael 30 minutes ago, <laughs> like literally. And she goes, I said, when? I said, when? And she goes, I don't know when yet, but I'm in L.A. Where are you? I said, I'm in Jersey, but I'm going to get on a plane and come to L.A. and I'll just wait until you're ready. And I did. I got on a plane, went to L.A., checked myself in a hotel, and I just waited until she called me back. And then she called me. She said, can you come tomorrow to my house? And the next day I was driving to her house, got through the gate, and as I went up that hill, she had this little guest house studio and I looked and I could see coming through the window Michael with a red shirt on just like my dream and I walked in there and I said I just I, uh, I, dream, I had a dream about this whole experience and I sat down at the piano and we were just like he was just singing melodies and I was playing and I think he was just getting wanting to get, get to know me and then at the end of it he said will you commit yourself to working with me? 
And I said, absolutely. He goes, you really got to dig deep if you're going to work with me. And I said, I'm, I'm with it. He goes, what do you need? And I said, I need my team with me. I need my team out here in LA. He said, okay, I'm going to have my assistant reach out and get you everything you need, the studio you need. He said, we're going to, we're going to be spending the next year working on my project. And that was it. And next thing you know, I just locked, we just became, and we became really good friends. Like me and Michael, we built an incredible, you know, beyond the music, like just a friendship, just a brotherhood. And yeah. And that was, that was it, man. Got, did, got going. did he remember you from the Teddy? Did he remember that? Or did you remind him about that? I reminded I mean, him and he was like, really? Like he almost, he almost, I don't think he really remembered the experience, that experience. So you, you, and by the way, that wasn't that far apart. You got to remember, I started working with Michael when I was 21. Yeah, because the album came out 2001. So you got, would have started around, was it 2000? I started, I started working with Michael in 1999, March. Oh, goodness. No, so ac actually, actually, I'm sorry. My first session with him that, that day was in February. That that Because I still yeah. have the cassette tape. That was, in, that was in February, 1999. I wasn't even 22 yet. I was 21. Wow. And um, so you're talking about literally a four to five year span. Yeah. You know, it wasn't that much, you know, it's crazy to me how fast that happened. What did you, because as I said, I, I, I'm, one, I'm, I'm a massive Michael fan. I bought the album the day it was released. And uh, Rock My World was like, you know, um, remember the time. But in, in, in um, Unbreakable, and Invincible, I would have thought should have been, that's just me as a Michael fan, would have been bigger and more Unbreakable. Powerful. Unbreakable was Michael's favorite song. Yeah. Off, off, off the album. Um, and Threaten. Actually, Unbreakable and Threaten was Michael's favorite song off the album. Rock My World was everybody's favorite song within the realms of the company, Everybody, like, you know, from a song perspective, not a track and all of that, but from an actual song, beginning to end song. Um, the plan was before, you know, things got sticky between him and Sony, the plan was Rock My World, Butterflies, Unbreakable, short film, Threatened, short film, and then break a dawn. Okay. That was the plan Michael had. I saw. I saw he sh showed it. Showed it to me, like that. He had it all mapped out what he was going to do. And then right after Rock My World, even before Rock My World came out, is when the Sony and Michael thing kind of just yeah went from it just started. It was it was going like that the whole project to be honest. But it really once the song right before the song came out, it really just kind of just became this separation and then, and then of course it doesn't do any uh, any of us no good because then we don't get to see the genius in its full entirety right because we the, the, all the stuff that he was telling us that he was going to do he didn't do yeah it happened and i i was like he was telling me i i remember him telling me about the short film he was going to do for unbreakable and how he was going to have biggie like before there was like um, a hologram or something? yeah before that was even happening he was going to do it like there wasn't even nobody was talking about holograms like that, and then yeah. he was talking about that. I wish that was his first single because it's it was it you know it's like the it's yeah because natu naturally it should have been the, the unbreakable first yeah yeah, yeah and yeah. then you come back with you yeah, know then rock world with, yeah 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 because yeah. so, it's because it's, it's more it's more um it's more urgent it's more it's more impactful and urgent like out yeah. the box yeah and then and then it would have surprised us that Biggie was on it but but I, the, I agree. the beat is just um it. Was, Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, so I was, I was, because as I said, I loved Rock My World, just like, because even remember the time, if it came out first, I mean, the video was great, but you needed that sort of black and white sort of to, you know, as a pop sort of thing, but then. And I, I don't know now, because I, because I also feel like from what we're talking about from that perspective is 100% correct. If you look at it from that perspective. Yeah. But because of what happened, we might not have got to rock my world and we might not have got to Chris Tucker and Michael Jackson and that historical moment between those two happening. Yeah. 
right? Because it was one and done. When Rock yeah. World came out, it was no, it was he didn't even have a video for butterflies. Yeah. You know what I mean? When you think about it, like there was no video for it because they shut it all down. They shut it all down. And yeah. so I don't know. You know, I I I've learned that whatever, whatever God has, God has. Yeah. And I you know, I don't, you know, I don't fret about it, but I do, I do a, a agree with you, like from like if you had to, if you had to really look at it from that perspective and how go boom 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 and yeah like, yeah oh, yeah totally yeah 100%. i mean it, yeah the, the powerful stuff i mean then because you, you 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 laid the foundation but then were you surprised that um because then I, I i know he i think one of my issues with invincible that he probably had three or four songs of too many that probably too many so, that too many to too many. And, and 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 actually we were all kind of shocked by that because um when he when we were making the album, he kept on saying, "I'm only going to have ten to eleven songs." That's, yeah, that would have been about. He kept he kept saying that the whole time. So then, when other songs started popping up at the end, you know, I'm, I'm not going to mention them, but there were songs that we know that sh just didn't sh that shouldn't have been on, and you know those songs as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like, why is this going on here? It doesn't need to be on this. It doesn't you know, need to be. Yeah. But, but maybe at that point in his life. He had relationships with, you know, the, the songwriters and producers, and he felt like it was a way, you know what I mean? I don't know. Okay. You know, but I just was like, I, he was, it went from, you know, being 10, 11 to like 15, 16, and it didn't have yeah. to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they had cut out four or five songs, it would have just been such a such a solid album. I mean, I love Butterflies. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and Break yeah. of Dawn was, was nice, but there were some others that I just thought, and um, that um, probably just... Yeah, I mean, as a fan, I'd listen to the whole thing, but I just thought it would have been just nice and, and, and succinct and stuff. Yeah. John John Marie said, you, you, you know, he was working, he brought, he, you know, it must have been interesting getting him involved with you, you know. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, because like one of my things was when we first started walking, working on Michael, um, I felt like I needed someone who reli that lived that experience because I was so young and I wanted to know, like, someone whether it was you know i knew i couldn't have bruce reading at my beck and call in the beginning mm -hmm. uh but i needed someone who 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 lived the michael experience so i called john marie and then john marie actually called bernard bell um and wow and man we were doing john marie would tell you we were mixing demos we were had we had orchestras we had orchestra on demos <laughs> We had full orchestra and working on, I remember we were doing a song called Privacy and we had a full orchestra on the demo. Full orchestra with a Sean Daniels singing the demo and a full orchestra. Oh my goodness. Yep, and John Marie was fully mixing the demos, like full on mixed days for the demos. Unbelievable. Was that the biggest project you've worked on? I mean, because I know you've done so much stuff with Gaga and, and, and so many other people, but being on such a big, Micro project is that one of those sort of things that you, you, you it's a benchmark for as a producer just doing especially if you do three four five six seven tracks that's Michael Jackson there's nobody bigger <laughs> nobody I don't care what anybody says no one bigger that's a monument that's a monumental moment for sure yeah you've 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 gone from you know, you, you do what, you, you know, your dad first called circular music, but you then you go back into doing some gospel stuff. Um, you did Revolution with Kurt Franklin, then you, you stuck him. How, how has that been for you to be able to... That was John Marie too, Revolution. John oh, Marie, okay, okay. John Marie, John Marie mixed that. That was before Michael. John Marie mixed that. He mixed Say My Name, Destiny Child. That was before Michael. Yeah, I was working with John Marie before that. Okay. Yeah. But, but but as I said, just with, with going back and forth from from gospel to to was that something that you felt that you needed to at least do some gospel tracks as well, or how was it? You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like I I, don't, I feel like, I feel like now I do, but I, I don't feel like <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't feel like I needed to. It was just more so um, I would get those calls. Like I would, you know, there was people who knew they knew me, they knew my background in the industry. And, you know, Jimmy Iovine, you know, was like, yo, we should get, you know, Vicky Mack and Jimmy Iovine, we should get Roddy to work with Kirk Franklin. <clears throat> you know, it was an idea. And we just, you know, and then I found myself working with him or working with Phase 2 or working with Mary Mary or working with Kiara Clark Shear. Throughout times, I found myself even calling certain gospel artists, be like, yo, I want to work with you. 
well, I don't have the budget. I'm like, I'll do it for free then. Wow. You know? and, <laughs> yeah. So it's just, you know, um, you know, it's the love of it, I, I guess. Yeah. The love, for, the love for it. You know, I didn't realize you you produced "Don't Want to Be a Player." I mean, okay. I, I don't think many people would know because because I think it's when we think of your sound, I guess your sounds aren't aren't. aren't so I know Teddy's track when I hear it, so, and it doesn't matter if I'm half asleep. If I hear, I'll know that's Teddy. Um, I'll know a Babyface song if I hear it. Doesn't matter. Um, and sometimes Jimmy and Terry, but yours doesn't have. In some, I mean, you got the artist to say "Dark Child," so we're like, "Oh, it's Rodney," but you do, you you mix around. So for you to have done Joe's one of Joe's sort of big tracks. Um, it just seemed like it went under the radar. I don't know. Did you get the credit for producing that? That people, because I, as I said, I. Yeah, I mean, listen. It went. I think it. it you know, it was one of my first R and B charting singles. Right mm -hmm. after the, th the things you do, um, it was one of my 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 first charting R and B singles. Um, I personally never wanted to be the producer that was considered a producer because of a sound, because mm -hmm. I felt like if you have just a sound and to me your time as a producer is somewhat limited in my opinion right because if you stuck in like you know a certain era then you'll just be looked at for that era yeah. so you know 1990 you, you say joe right i think i cre i created that that track in like 94 it might have came out when 96 but i want to say i wrote it and created like 94 95 right so let's yeah. just say Let's just say Joe comes out 90, 96. 96 right? yeah. But I'm working with, let's say, you know, um, Sam Smith in 2015. You're talking about almost 20 years later. You know yeah. what I mean? Two different worlds. Like, imagine Sam doing a Joe sound. That's just not going to go. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, or, or, or Deja Vu for Beyonce in 2006 sounding like 1996 don't want to be played those are two different worlds yeah and, and i and i would do that purposely like everybody close to me knows like i would go into like these deep um these deep moments where it's like okay i gotta reinvent myself right because it was a period it was periods where it was like okay um the boy's mine j-lo if you have my love whitney houston is not right but it's okay does he shall say my name and he wasn't man enough by Tony Braxton. All of those songs were in a similar sonic spectrum. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then it was like, okay, I can't do that no more. I can't. I can't do it no more. I got to go somewhere else. So then it was like, okay, I got to challenge myself to go somewhere else where people wanted me to stay there, by the way. Right. The industry. Yeah. The ARs, they want you to stay right there because that's radio. So whatever's <laughs> working, that whatever's working, they just want you to stay there. But me personally, for me, I was like, nah, I want to have longevity. I want to be someone who can do this for 30, 40 years and touch decades and decades of music. And if, but if I stay in one particular side, it's, it'll be over before it gets started. Yeah. I just, I just knew that. Um, and I knew that because I, I would study the greats before me and I would see it like, uh oh, uh oh, now things are moving on and they're still doing the same <laughs> thing. Yeah. That's now you can't do that. So my thing was to always challenge myself every three to five years. I want to challenge myself, see if I can do something different. And that's what Jam and Lewis, because you, you, you they're still doing stuff for her. Totally. And you're thinking they came out in the 80s with the SOS band and Alexander O'Neill, but you won't know that they're still charting with stuff. Um yep. so yeah, so that's that that the the part that you had. Artists, Michael Jackson did it in Rock My World. Uh, Tony did it, Man Enough, Dark Child. How did it, what happens? Because I always remember when Bobby says, Yo, uh, in, in my prerogative, Yo, Ted, can we take it like this? So, how did yeah. you get them to say, yeah. Okay, I want <laughs> the trademark? Did, 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 did you hear this? Listen, Dark Child. That's Michael. <laughs> that's Michael. Oh, that's Michael. Okay. <laughs> oh, did you hear Dark that? Child. That's yeah. Whitney. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, what it's like trying to get them to do a, a radio drop from how did you sort of convince hey, listen, them? To... <laughs> I, I believe I stand by this. I believe I started the producer tag. <laughs> you know how producers have the tags on all their songs now? Um 
So like a lot of the hip hop songs, you got producers be like, you know, uh, Murder Beats did, or or, or uh, what's the guy? Um, uh, what's the producer? Uh, Mike Will. Mike Will made it. Like you got all these producers that okay. have. Like, they call producer tags. Yeah, I, I believe I was the first one doing producer tags. Yeah, because no one else was. I mean, it was you know. I was doing it when I was seventeen. When I was before I had Dark Child. I used to go, I used to remix records and go, another Rodney Jerkins remix, y'all. He said I couldn't do it again, but I did. I used to say that. And that was okay. my tag. I was saying on all my remixes. So I felt like I was the first one that did the producer tag. But how uh, did you get the artist to, I mean, did, did, you know. Yeah, I, got tired of, I got tired of doing it myself. And, and the thing about it was, that's one of the reasons. So when <laughs> I, I was doing it on all the records, right, I was doing it on all the records. And then the artist would actually be, come, the artist, when they would meet me, They'd be like, dark child, hey, dark child, <laughs> right? So I'd be like, oh, you sound good. You should do it. So even when I worked with her, like when I worked with her on her last album, she did, I'd have to tell her to do it. She walked in the booth. She's like, dark child. They just do it now. Every artist that I work with, even to this day, they just, I don't even have so to. So is it, as they a, just before it. it starts, they just say it in the, and they you just, just record it? They just go in the booth and they just do it. They just okay. do it. Okay, and, it just, and it's almost like they just want to do it because they've heard so many of the artists. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm just all right, cool. I'm like, cool. Let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> Where did the nickname come from? It came from. Um, it was really. It wasn't. It was more my production company name at the time. We um were trying to find a cool name to create, and um, I was playing like I was playing a lot of like dark minor chords at that time, and. Built the, built the name around that sound and me being so youthful, so young, the child came from that. Um, yeah, and it just stuck. It just okay, really so it wasn't the fact that you left the gospel scene and do secular music oh, and the dark child oh, of the family. Oh, please don't say that, man. Just, just, oh, no, <laughs> no. no. I, ho I hope not. I hope that's not. Man, can you imagine? No. Oh, that's the first by the way, that's the first time I heard that. Oh, it's okay. Oh, I've never heard that. That's 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 an interesting chicken. I mean, I'm gonna have to change my name to Light Child. No, 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 no. yeah. You know, you are the one first person to give us a J Lo track. It was a big hit, and most of us were like, what? she's a dancer. And then you gave us that if you're not well, um what was your I mean I didn't know she was a dancer. I didn't know any of that. I just knew I just all I all I knew was I needed to they told me they'll I, I'm like Floyd Mayweather. They say line them up, and then I and I and I'll do the rest. So when when Tommy Matola called me, he was like, "Man, I got this this artist. She she's actually he actually says she's a, a she's a she's a movie star, and you know and and I, and I need I need I need you to help crack the code on her. That's what he said. And and then so I remember meeting her, and and I remember like sitting down with Lashawn one day, and I was just telling him that I was like. We gotta approach it from a very um, a vulnerable place, and it just kind of spoke. Like I kind of just started playing. Like I started playing this somewhat of like it's almost like a guitar sound, but it's almore like a harpsichord guitar. Mm -hmm. Like blend, I've kind of blended it, and then I went kind of Latin. I was doing what I do. Like I, I always did these like like these like I chop up arpeggios and I do these things. But I was like. Let me let me give it a little bit of just a tiny bit of Latin because that's who she was. And man, I had no idea it was gonna be as big as it was. Like, you know, imagine scoring the 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 first number one single on J Lo, you know, which she wasn't even J Lo at the time. She was yeah. just Lopez. So, you know, I didn't know and and but next thing you know, it was huge. Now, I mean the myth that we had is, you know, that's the record that's in a way sort of said if J-Lo could sing, anyone can sing, and, and it became the whole auto-tune stuff. And that was the stuff that went on, on, the, on the scene. Um, I've seen her sing live now a lot, but back in those days, I mean, was it a case of, okay, she's very attractive, she's got a, 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 you know, a good look, um, but we need to, she's not vocally like Beyonce, so we need to do some magic in the studio. Here's the sound to get the vocals up. Um, but, or was it the case that well, actually she can sing and and you know? I never looked. I never. I don't think I've ever approached it from that standpoint. I think I, I approached it as let's let's just try to make a great song. Let's just try to write a good song, and you know let 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 
Tommy Matola do what he do with his with Sony and their marketing team and all of that. But let's just make a good song as if, you know, whether it could work for her or work for whoever, let's just make a good song. I never really, like, I never, I never, I don't know, maybe because I worked with other artists that got judged that way before, even before her. I worked with Britney before her, you know, so, it, you know, I worked with different people who might not have the, who who you don't call like, oh, they're not like Whitney Houston or Beyonce, oh, but they're, yeah. you know, they, um, but you know, you 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 work with them, you know, and I've seen I've seen Teddy work with artists like that as well, and and you know, give them a sound and give them you know some cool stuff. Yeah, you know? I mean, I, yeah, I love this. I love the album. I love yeah. this. Song. And, then, and then it just happens, like you just like you just, and then it just then it happens, and it's like, wow, this turned out bigger than what we even expected. What, what what would be your top five Dark Child production? Ooh, I never, I never <laughs> asked that question. Um, top five. Um, I'm probably going to go. Am I working backwards or starting at yeah, one? It, 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 you, no, well, you, no, you, five, I'll start at five. Yeah, start at five. Yeah. I'll start at five. I had to go. If I had to play five right now from a production, from a production standpoint, um, number five, I'm probably going to play is um i'm gonna play he wasn't man enough okay Tony i'm gonna go four i'm gonna go to um from a production standpoint i'm gonna go probably to brandy um what about us okay just because it was just so different at the time when it came out Three, I'm going to go to uh, Michael Jackson, probably Unbreakable. Mm. Um, and then two, I'm going to go to I Can Love You, Mary J. Blige. And then one, I'm going to go to Say My Name, Dusty Shop. Okay. UK inspired, by the way. <laughs> you know, how's that UK? It because it happened so they didn't sing to the actual track like when i was in the uk i was in the uk oh i was in the uk working with the spice girls before i worked with destiny's child and i went to a club one night with them and their d there was a dj playing what was called i believe like two-step music and i was so intrigued by the rhythms that i was hearing because i never i'd never been to uk i never heard those rhythms mm. so I, I went up to the dj and i asked him could he make me a, a cd of a bunch of two-step garage music and he did he brought it to the hotel and I flew I flew on a plane my first session after I got back to the states was with Destiny's Child and they really sang to a two-step beat now after the two-step beat was over that's when uh everybody didn't like it no one liked it everybody just thought it was trash and then fast forward to um the day of the mix, John Marie, John Marie, took, I walked in, I walked in the studio and I told John Marie, I said, can you pull down the track and just leave the vocals up? And he said, why? We were mixing. I was like, everybody was right. I'm wrong. This is, this is trash. Like, this is not good. And he goes, you sure? And I was like, I'm positive. They're right. I'm wrong on this one. And I humbled myself and I went back and I redid all of, all of the, the track, the, the whole track over. And now it became it became say my name as you know it now, and it was my first Grammy. So it's like a it's somewhat this is a whole the story of it is somewhat an emotional wow. attachment to it because of the way it happened. But it was definitely UK inspired from the gate. It ended up not being that, by the way, right? It ended <laughs> up not being a two step, but it was inspired by that from wow. from, from, from day one. Yeah, no, because it was very different, and um, yeah. It was a very different type of beat, and that's the same thing that we do say about you: is that you, you, it's not something that we can always say that you still do the same thing. You had your top five Darktail productions, but what what will you be? Were any of them would you be your, your favorites? Your, your, you know, your, your top three favorite songs that even if they weren't as successful, that like you just felt that this was. Mm. Mm. I'll, I'll um, maybe ask me that in about 10 more years and then I'll let you, I'm still, I'm still working. 
Because I think people were saying, how come he didn't say the boy's mind? Because that was one of your biggest sort of... Oh, I forgot about it. Man, <laughs> see, you remind me. It's funny, but you said productions, though. I'm just, I'm just, you know, if, yeah. if you said, if you said song, yeah, your favorite songs, yeah, your favorite. You know, if you said songs, that would have definitely be top three, in okay. my opinion. Boys, mine might even arguably be number one. Yeah. You know, you know, but you said production, so I, from a production standpoint, yeah, from a duck, yeah. The boy's mind to me it, as a producer is it's just okay. It's, it's you know, it was it was cool. It wasn't to me from a production standpoint, my not, it wasn't the, the my greatest production, but it was cool. Yeah. But top, but as a song, it's a really good song. Was it inspired by um the girl is mine from Thriller? Totally. Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. Not not in a not in a melodic way. Yeah, but not, that same argument. That's... Way, but the argument between Two was to totally inspired by, by there was a by, song you by. did on Invincible, and I think it was um um I think it was Heartbreak um I can't remember which one it was. Heartbreaker, yeah, Heartbreaker. That actually reminded me of um a number of tracks from Bad. It sounded it had it almost felt oh. like yeah, though I mean listen to it recently and I thought, yeah, this there was a summer star track that reminded me like an uh, an amalgamation of a couple of songs um uh, from Bad. You know, just before we leave, no one of the things that we, we I do ask all of, all of my guests that if you were stuck in an elevator and you had to, it was going to take about a couple of hours to get you out, but you could watch a movie while they're fixing the elevator. What would you want to watch? Step Brothers. <laughs> That's the one with Mark, Will, Mark Will, Will Ferrell. No, no Will Ferrell. Oh, Will, Will Ferrell. Step, Step Brothers. <laughs> okay. Uh, I like to laugh. Okay. I like to laugh. And in the moment of being stuck in the elevator, yeah. you better make me laugh because <laughs> I don't want to be stuck in the elevator. So I'm going to need something to lift my spirit. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, Step Brothers is one of my favorite all time. I got a lot of, a few different movies, but that's just one that just, when I feel like I want to laugh, I turn that on and I'm just, okay. like, I'm instantly laughing. Like, okay. it was the first five minutes. Okay. And then finally, what's your all time favorite song that you, you just, by any artist, just your favorite song? Um, I, ooh, that's a tough, tough question. Um, I think the a song that has got me so many times when it comes on, just from beginning to end, is I want to say the Bee Gees, How Deep Is Your Love? Uh, it's always... It's one. It, it's it's. I, I'm gonna give you two, because that one is that lives in the in the secular space. <laughs> Greater. My favorite song is a song called um um. The Winings actually. Um, what's the name of the song? Drawing a blank. Um, not tomorrow. Um, uh, why am I drawing a blank? You you listen to the Winans? Not, I mean, I, I mean, it, it's time album was pretty much the 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 one that I've listened to. Oh years. yeah, so just from a like a from a from a song perspective, the song that really just has really like moved me throughout my throughout my life. Like like you know, you have certain songs that if you want, you you know, you you need, you just need to feel differently. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say the, the Winans had a song called Straighten My Life Out. Okay. Uh, and I particularly like the version of them singing it live on YouTube. You can watch it. They sing it live at a place called The Beverly in LA. And it's just a song that just like, it's it's just my, it's one of my go-tos. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll check that out. How Deep Is Your Love by the Bee Gees is, is just like a, it's like almost a perfect song. Yeah. To end, beginning to end. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know, it's been it's definitely been great listening to you. I mean, I can't go by and not ask you about your top five Teddy productions. You know, from because uh, as a big fan as we both are, what, what would yeah. what would be in your top five sort of Teddy? Top productions? top five would, would be um, Rum Shaker okay. with him and Pharrell, with him and Pharrell, mm. Roughneck, Roughneck. Um, um remember the time okay um key sweat let's make it last number two and then one 
Oof. One would probably be. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go young Teddy. I'm gonna go like. I'm gonna go like I like Teddy. I'm gonna go to okay. that. It's so many. It's hard. You can't really. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm gonna go young. I'm gonna go to like a young. I like that that vibe. And I'm forgetting so many. Like I can yeah. say, I can go to No Diggity and I can go <laughs> to the ob- to the obvious hits. But yeah, so, so many. Like even his ballads. I could like Teddy doesn't get the the credit he deserves even for his ballads. Like we can we can go. We can talk about Smile songs that weren't even singles that were just like yeah really yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, piece of my love. Um, yeah. um Let's chill. Let us yes, chill. I mean, if you had a choice, if you're thinking about his, he did most of the albums. So he has Keep Sweat, Make It Last Forever album, or the Bobby album, um, or the Blackstreet album. Out of those three, which would you think is, you know what? If somebody says, give me an album of Teddy that I can listen to to think, well, this is a real production, which of those three would you recommend being the main one? All three. No, yeah, yeah, I know, but I mean, I, uh, I love for all me, three. Yeah. For me, for me, man, I don't know. I just feel like, I, for me, I felt like when he when he did that Bobby album, he was in he was he was in a different stride, in my opinion. It was just in a, it was a zone. Him and his team were in just like a that every song that they did on that album, yeah, was just like consistent. Sonically, vocally, even Bobby sound amazing on those yeah, songs. Yeah, my favorite. Everything, the kill rapping, everything was just like, you know, if, if you had to have a part two, because you got to remember following up from prerogative and all of that, yeah. it's hard to do. Yeah. But if you had to put like get away right after Pop Rock, you're like, whoa, this is pretty, this is pretty good. This is yeah. pretty, pretty good. Yeah, I, I'm going to go with Bobby, even though I love the other ones you mentioned, but I'm going to go with Bobby. What can we expect from you? Production-wise, because you mentioned her. I mean, what, Still working, what, man. I just I'm, I'm working with um, SZA and Ty Dolla Sign and her. Wow. And, wow. Yeah, so I'm just staying staying in it, focused. Uh, I'm also venturing into doing like this Christian hip hop space. I'm starting a new label in that space, and I'm real excited about. My kids love Christian hip hop, so we're building. I'm building a company with them together. I mean, how how are you managing music today? Because it is, it's, you know, it's it's. It, I think the labels are it's there. Funny. Right now, it's kind of interesting for me because it's like all of these artists are calling me, telling me they want what I, they want the '90s type of progressions and stuff. So it's like easy for me. I'm like, all right, cool. Like that's you know, I sit down and play a couple chords, and they freak out. I'm like, this is so crazy. Like I, did <laughs> I was on this 25 years ago, and you guys are like they think it's new. They because it's Bruno new. isn't Bruno? Didn't he know? Me and something? Teddy, me and Teddy, going to do a camp together. Me and Teddy, I was just on the phone with Teddy, like two, three weeks ago, and I was at a ride doing where he's like, yo, I want to, I want to, he said, I want to join your writing camp. He heard about my writing camps I did, and I say, all right, we're going to do one together. Wow. You know what I mean? So me and him, when he comes back from Africa, we'll, we'll get together and do a writing camp together. Wow. So, I mean, are your kids going to get into it? Because I do okay. see you post with your, <laughs> your daughter. Yeah, my kids are very into it. Very into it. My little one is going to be a producer. My seven-year-old, he's really into the production, and my 12-year-old girl, daughter, they're both into the production side of it and my and my 30 year old's an a r like ear and then my <laughs> nine-year-old girl she's a violinist pianist so they're all into it they all love music wow i won't wow. force them into it but if they love it they'll do it yeah but man yeah. it's been an amazing chatting with you bro amazing. yeah yeah <laughs> big fan of big fan of what you guys do the halftime chat really yeah Oh, I appreciate it. I, I, I mean, it's, I try to tune in as much as I can, so I appreciate you having uh, me. Oh, no, no, goodness. I, I appreciate the time, as I said, as a Teddy fan, as a Michael fan, but as a massive fan of yourself. I mean, it, it's been, um, and, and as I said, I, I've seen, I see your stuff on, 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 on IG and I see what you're doing. And and I, and I did see last year when you, you did push about your, your camp and I was really excited to start to see that you are, you're still are able to, to to make your music. I do hope you come up with your own artists because we, you know, and 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 we'll hopefully see. we'll hopefully we'll start to see you you're releasing the, your own artists on your own label and 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 giving us some some consistent stream of stuff from from that you can do the visual control the visual as well yeah. as the musical stuff. Yeah. yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, so appreciate it. It's uh, it's, you, it's about eleven thirty. Anytime. Anytime. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe and turn on the notification button, but also check out our membership offers where you can actually watch all these videos um, as soon as they're released 
um, especially without any of those uh, YouTube ads. But thanks again for watching and being part of the Halftime Chat community.